Thank you all for joining Habitat for Humanity, Seattle King County, the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County, and the Tacoma Pierce County Habitat for Humanity for this virtual panel discussion. And we're gonna be talking about, this is the latest in a series of discussions we've been having about affordable home ownership and advocacy. My name is Ross Reynolds, and we're here to talk about the year of housing in the Washington legislature. Some of you joined us in December when we looked ahead to the session with a panel of housing advocates. And today we're talking with the lawmakers about what happened. So I'd like you to meet our panel and state legislators and housing champions. With us today, State Senator John Lovick, and also with us, State Representative Emily Alvarado, and we expect to be joining us soon, State Senator Yasmin Trudeau and House Speaker Representative Lori Jenkins. So thanks again for joining us on Zoom and we'll be taking questions from you later in the hour. Just drop your questions and comments into the chat box as we go along. And in the interest of time, I'd like our panelists to try to keep their answers to three minutes or less. So let's kick off with, if you could each of you briefly tell me, what did you plan to have happen in the housing in the session? And then how much went according to plan? And we'll start with you, Senator Levick. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, I've I heard your voice many, many times, and it's just as crisp and clear as I've heard it before. You know, I, I'll just start by saying what an honor it is to, to, to be in front of you, and it's a great uh, honor to join uh, Representative Alvarado. I've seen her on campus many, many times, and we've just never had much time to talk because uh, it's a busy process down there. But uh, this, for me, and I spent 16 years in the House, and this is my second year in the Senate, and this, to me, was I felt one of the best sessions ever because we expected, we knew we had to get things done and we went to Olympia prepared to address homelessness, to, to address housing and all of those things. And I think we did it. And I can't wait uh, to try and not knowing how much time I've used so far. Uh, I can't wait to talk with you about something that was very, very big that uh, Representative Frank Chop brought to our attention about the uh, covenant home ownership uh, investment that we did. So yes, and we'll definitely be getting to that. I'm sure you will. So I, I would say, uh, other than maybe having a conversation, I was in the governor's office probably twice this year and having him want to do the $4 billion, I think he wanted $4 billion in bonds and not being able to get to that. This was to me one of the most successful years that I have seen in, in this area uh, in my time in, in the uh, Olympia. So that's, uh, I think what we got what we expected. We expected people to work hard. We expected people to deliver. And uh, every time I talked to the governor, every time I talked with anyone, I said, people elected us to get things done. And I believe we got a lot, a lot done this uh, this, this session. We should be better all, than we should you, all be Thank you. Better, better than you had hoped or? You know, I, I you, you, you always have to look at things and I always tell people that everything looks good in isolation. Uh, we mm -hmm. can isolate a few things and maybe it could look good or look bad. But I, I think for me, it was better than I had hoped. I, it, it was just outstanding. We have to take the good with the good. And it was just a great year. And uh, let's uh, turn to Representative Emily Alvarado. When you were looking ahead to the, this legislative session, what did you plan to have happen? And could you talk about what actually did happen, how it compared to what you had hoped for? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Ross. Good to be here with you today. Um, thanks to Senator Lovick and I see Speaker Jenkins. Great to be with you all. Um, and thanks to Habitat for Humanity and uh, Housing Development Consortium for hosting this event. Um, as you all know, this was my first session. So there were a lot of things I didn't know going in, but um, my background is in housing and affordable housing advocacy. So I certainly came in with a lot of hope that we can make meaningful progress on the um, real crisis that we have in our communities around housing. And we've heard so much from advocates, from neighbors, from community partners about how we needed to go big in housing. Um, and I think everyone knows at this point what we have in terms of a housing crisis. We have a massive housing shortage, a million homes short that we need in over 20 years. And then we have some um, other more unique crises that are part of that, right? We know that 500,000 of those homes need to be affordable to the lowest income people in our communities. So we have to be producing market rate housing and affordable housing. And we also know that a lot of people are experiencing homelessness and people are falling into homelessness um, 
renters lose their homes as well. And so we have to make sure that we're stabilizing renters, um, we're stabilizing homeowners, and we're preventing homelessness. I think this session was um, really tremendous as it came to building momentum and shared advocacy and shared commitment around increasing our overall housing stock. We made real progress on expanding housing supply, making it easier to build homes. Um, we made some record investments in our housing trust fund. And I think there's still a lot more work that we can do to make sure that we're uh, creating the affordable homes that our communities need and making sure that renters have protect, uh, protections and predictability so that they can keep their homes as well. Uh, Speaker Jenkins, the, the same question for you, kind of going into the session, what were your hopes? And now that the session is concluded, how did it, it perform in terms of housing issues? Well, in terms of housing issues, Ross, I, I mean, I, I couldn't say anything more than what uh, Rep. Alvarado just said. It was an extraordinary year, um, investing over a billion dollars in housing. And I, I guess I just want to echo what she said we still have a lot more we have to do, but we made great strides this year. I, I did want to talk a little bit. First of all, sorry for hopping on a little bit late. I'm running as fast as I can today, which is apparently just a little bit slower than I should be running. Um, so I'm glad to be able to be here with everybody. I wanted to talk a little bit, though, because uh, about some of the kind of the interlinked priorities that we had. Um well, some of the other priorities, which are interlinked, I would say. So, for example, our work, the work that we wanted to do on workforce, we there is no part of our um, kind of economic environment that doesn't have a, sh a workforce shortage. And the housing issue touches the workforce issue, right? Because people can't get housing, especially at, at some of the salaries that they're making. And so uh, the housing is related there. Our work on, um, on behavioral health, also having permanent supportive housing for people, a huge issue that we also made some really good inroads in this year, but, uh, but that was a high priority for our caucus, and that is also linked. And then our work on climate also is related to the housing issue, right? It, they, these all connect with each other. The Venn diagram is very big with a lot of overlaps. Um, one of the other things I would just say as a general rule that's outside of ho housing, really, that I'm very proud of the work we did this year was on protecting people's bodily autonomy uh, when it comes to uh, uh, pregnant people and uh, a woman's right to choose, as well as uh, trans folks when, uh, and their, uh, their ability to get gender affirming care. We saw laws passed all over this nation that restrict and harm communities in this regard, and we took the opposite approach and we're uh, are being protective in really big ways and I'm very proud of the work that the House Democratic Caucus and the legislature did uh, to get those bills across the finish line. Uh, Senator Yasmin Trudeau is, is with us now and uh, our, our first question for you was kind of looking ahead to the legislature last year what were your expectations and now that the legislative session is finished when it comes to housing how do you think it did and I think yeah there you go. Thank you. Um, and apologies for being a couple minutes late. I'm sort of navigating no getting back to my day job and parenting all at the same time. Um, but, you know, going into the session, I think it's probably been covered if it, for folks that have spoken before me. But really what I heard was we need to work on housing. Like this is going to be the year for housing. This is going to be the year that we, you know, go big. Right. Uh, what is it? Go big to go home, uh, I think, is what I heard recently, which I absolutely love. Like, um, you know, and coming out of the legislative session, I think we made historic strides um, in that direction. I think there's going to be uh, continued work around issues like affordability, right, to, to do, I think, a lot more for those folks that are in situations where they're renting and possibly, um, you know, deal or not possibly that are dealing with skyrocketing rents and other things that are sort of displacing people um, from being stable um, onto the street. So I think there's more work to be done. But my goodness, like, we did a lot. And I would emphasize that we did do affordability measures. It's not as though we didn't invest in affordable housing, you know, in our capital budget, um, which I had to, the, the honor and privilege of working on, had over $400 million in the housing trust fund, had a lot, um, which I think is double uh, historically what was done. So it's not that we didn't do that. I just think that that's an opportunity for us to 
um, continue in, in policy and investments to make sure that we're we're really doing uh, everything that we can. Um, but I think considering that we had 105 days, we did a lot. So I think we absolutely met um, our targets and, you know, we can't solve everything. Like we're not going to, in one session, we're not going to figure out all the solutions, but um, I feel leaving session in terms of the housing space, just incredibly proud and so appreciative of my colleagues. Yeah, of course, not everything is going to work out, but I wanted to ask each of you to sort of give a top line, uh, the biggest win when it comes to housing and the biggest loss. What was your most, what did you most regret not getting through? And, and starting with you, Representative Emily Alvarado, the, the, what, what are you most proud of? What was the thing that you think really worked for housing the largest thing and then the biggest loss? Well, pinpointing one victory is always difficult. Uh, so I might slide in two. Uh, but first of all, after years of advocacy, uh, House Bill 1110 missing middle passed, which was really tremendous. Um, Senator Trudeau, I think, was the sponsor in the Senate, so I hate to steal your win and talk about it, but I'll echo her win, which is, um, you know, we have lots of communities across the state of Washington that aren't producing any homes. And for those communities, like the one that I live in, I'm able to buy a home uh, over a decade ago. I wouldn't be able to buy a home today. And, uh, you know, zoning reform and allows it, allowing more housing choices, four plexes, six plexes, really makes a difference in housing choice, especially for moderate income families who are looking to buy in communities across the state. It really helps to undo some historic wrongs which have blocked out people, particularly people of color, from living in uh, communities of choice. So that was a tremendous win. Um, I think another win, as Senator Trudeau mentioned, was uh, making record investments in the Housing Trust Fund. We know that the Housing Trust Fund is a proven mechanism to help drive resources into communities across the state, rural and urban and suburban, to help create affordable homes. We made investments pivoting to what I'd like to see. We still need to make sure that those kinds of investments can be regular and continuous and sustainable. Uh, the only way we're gonna get to scale is by making regular investments. So we gotta keep looking towards the resources that'll create predictability for affordable housing. And then I'd mention, um, I was disappointed that we weren't able to make more progress on stabilizing renters uh, in mm -hmm. my district. 40% of my constituents are renters. Statewide, yeah. we have over a million renters in our state, and they deserve the kind of predictability month to month, year to year that I get as someone who pays a mortgage. So more work to do there to make sure that renters are stabilized. Great. And the same question for you, Speaker Jenkins. Uh, when it comes to the biggest win and maybe the biggest loss, what would you say about the session when it comes to these housing issues? Uh, well, Ross, uh, rather than just repeating everything that Representative Alvarado says, I'm just going to add other big wins. That, so I, I'm going to add on to hers because I think uh, I, I agree with her about those big wins. But a couple others I want to just mention in terms of housing is um, we just the governor just signed Representative Taylor's uh, Covenant Home Ownership Bill, um, uh, that which was House Bill, I think, 1474. Um, I don't remember numbers very much anymore. I remember topics. But um, th this is going to help with communities who have been uh, historically disenfranchised and prohibited from buying homes because of covenants all over the state of Washington. It will help those families who've been historically disadvantaged with down payment costs and with closing costs. We do know that home ownership is one of the ways that we build generational wealth and communities of color in particular in Washington state have been prohibited, actually prohibited by covenants and by law in the state from developing that kind of generational wealth. So this is a step into being able to do that. Also, I think Rep. Gregerson had a great bill that we've been working on for a couple years on accessory dwelling units, which again will help um, uh, Emily talked about the missing middle bill, but uh, the, the ADU bill will also help provide kind of more infill housing, more another another way for us to uh, house people for uh, less cost um, um, probably and uh, help individual families. 
um, be able to, you know, afford their 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 mortgage as they have an ADU potentially in their backyard. So I think that was those were great wins. I uh, I totally agree with Rep Alvarado in terms of uh, the work that we need to do um, for renters and mm-hmm. making sure that we stabilize rents. But the other thing I really want to mention, which which Rep Alvarado mentioned this a little bit too, I think it's the stable funding. We had two uh, stable funding funding for housing over the long term. Listen, we can't build a million homes uh, over half of them, which need to be for low income or extraordinarily low income people without having a funding stream to do that. The governor had a bonding proposal this year. We also, Rep Chop also had a great proposal on real estate excise tax, which interestingly would have actually brought down taxes for the majority of people who are selling their homes, but only for those who were, you know, raising them a little bit for uh, the wealthy few who have homes that, you know, cost or would sell for more than $3 million or even more than that. Um, So I think those are things that we need to keep on looking at next year, working on over the interim. Um, I wouldn't really say I ever get too awfully disappointed about anything because I've been in the legislature for a long time and I realize it's an incremental place. But these are that's those are topics where I think we need to keep on keep the work going and get there. Got to keep your sunny side up. Uh, Senator Lovick, I want to jump to you because I know that you wanted to talk about the Covenant Home Ownership Account Bill that we just heard referenced by Lori Jenkins. Uh, could you explain a little bit about how this addresses the harms associated with racially restrictive covenants and talk about how it's going to fix that? Yeah, thank you, Ross. And I, everything that I've heard so far has just been marvelous. Listening to Speaker Jenkins, I, I always tell people I love serving in the Senate, but I do miss being in the House because I don't get to hear those conversations <laughs> because of her passion. And I, I, I get to work, rep, work with Senator Trudeau and her passion. And I, I see a lot of passion coming from Senator Alvarado. So let, let me just take you back for just a second, uh, Ross. In September, I met with uh, former Speaker Chop in uh, Seattle. And he shared with me some of the covenant restrictions. And I have to tell you this. I don't think I had more shame in my heart than I had after reading some of those covenants. You know, there's a a great line in a a book by uh, Tom Brokaw when he talked about the shame of a nation. And what those covenants reminded me of is that it reminded me of what shame really looks like. And it is important for us to remember what shame looks like. I read some of those covenants and I I know the governor read one the other day at uh, the signing of uh, House Bill 1474. And it specifically talked about people who could not live in communities. Now, I was born and raised in Louisiana. And I tell people all the time, there was clearly places we could not go. Bathrooms were marked colored only, uh, colored in rear. So I knew what those things were like. I did not think or believe that those things took place in the Pacific Northwest. But again, it still reminds us of what shame looks like. So when I read some of those covenants, and we started working on it immediately. I worked with uh, Representative Taylor, and I'm sure she was working on her leadership team. But what helped us get that across the finish line? was the leadership. And I'm talking about the leadership from Speaker Jenkins. I'm talking about leadership from uh, Senator Trudeau. I'm talking about leadership from uh, Representative Alvarado because people recognized that we had to correct some of the harms that were caused by those covenant restrictions. And so Lovett, the- let me ask you kind of, maybe you could help make this more real to us by explaining how this bill will repair these harms associated with these racially restrictive covenants at the state level? What will it actually do for someone who was harmed by those uh, horrifying covenants? I, I can just put it in two simple terms. It's going to help them with uh, down payment and closing costs. And those are tremendous things to help a person with. I shared that when I purchased my first home, I was in the military. I purchased my first home. I had some bonds saved and I put $200 down and, and the VA sent me $150 back. It was pretty easy for me back then when I purchased my first home. So it's going to help with down payments and help with closing costs. And that's that's what we're going to need. That's what that that is what is, I believe, has kept many, many people from being able to access home ownership. And that is how you build generational wealth. I've been very, very fortunate. I was able to convince my kids 
to save money and buy a home. And uh, they're, they, they were able to listen to me, but that's where it's going to help people in our communities, communities yes, that have been. And, and just so you know this, uh, Ross, roughly $150 million uh, due to uh, will be raised uh, in, in this uh, for in this uh, project program. Well, Sorry. And people who have heard about this bill passing might be going, this is fantastic. This is really going to help me out. What's when will the mechanism kick in? When could people actually start applying for this assistance because of the harm that they suffered? You know, I don't know the date. I bet uh, Senator Trudeau will probably be able to answer that. I was, wasn't keeping up with those specific details, and maybe uh, Senator Trudeau can help with that. Yeah, help yeah. Let's, let's go to Senator Yasmin Trudeau. Do you know when people will be able to apply for this relief under the Covenant Home Ownership Account Bill? Sorry, I was actually just about to look up the specifics of the bill, but it is based on document recording fees. So there is a period of time in which these, this funding has to be built, right? Because when somebody uh, has a document that they're going to record, then that money goes into this pool. So let me follow up and find the specifics. Of course, in this moment, I can't remember it, but okay. I appreciate Senator Lovick believing in me. Um, but the, you know, the legislation itself, it starts, at, you know, governor signs it. 90 days after governor signs it, right? The bill goes into effect. So I think we're gonna we're gonna see what happens as these fees start to accrue. But I'll find you the answer. I've got yeah, it, it here. Goes so. effect, it goes into effect 723 of, of, of this year. Yeah. Okay. So and knowing what we see in, in transactions, right? Because these document recording fees were also uh, specifically tied to real estate transactions. And we know real estate is booming um in, in this state. People are moving. That's why we're having, you know, the deficit in housing. So um but I will find what that says. It's just going to take some time for those build for those fees to build. It looks like the speaker came off though. Well, Ross, it, I just yeah. am noting that somebody put in the chat that by July 1st of 2024, if you look at the bill, um, one or more of the special purpose credit programs must begin to allow and provide for down payment clo and closing cost assistance. So it'll be July, it'll be July 1st next year when okay. folks will actually be start to get that assistance. So, so we'll have a year, we'll have a year of collecting the right. doc yeah. reporting fee so that we can fully fund the program. Great. And then at that point, I guess we'll know whether that was enough because people will begin to apply for it and is will it will it deal with it? So that'll be something to look for in the future. Senator Trudeau, I wanted to talk about a couple of other key measures that we've alluded to. And one was the zoning reform House Bill 1110, a big topic of our conversation in December when we talked about the upcoming session. And then the accessory dwelling unit bill, the ADU Bill 1337. Could you just review for us what the zoning reform bill did? Yeah. So it, no, I appreciate that. So what the bill did is it now you cannot exclusionarily zone, right? So you can't exclusively zone for single family homes. In the bill, it's got certain measures that, you know, the closer you are to transit, right? That they'll be like, the, the closest to transit is a sixplex, it goes fourplex, it goes duplex, um, in order to accommodate, um, you know, making sure that we are creating more density around transit hubs, but that we are also allowing for the type of access that um, Representative Alvarado talked about earlier, housing options, right? And I'll, I just wanna plug, you know, for me, one of the reasons that I felt so passionately about this bill is because exclusion, exclusionary zoning actually has a very racist past and an incredibly racist history. The idea that we would only want, right, a neighborhood that looks a certain way, that is rooted in principles that I think a lot of folks that fought that bill we don't understand and sometimes we don't want to acknowledge that sometimes we can be part of something painful because we enjoy it now right we're not enjoying it because it's it we're bad people but i think that getting getting the conversations across about how this bill it doesn't eliminate single family zoning if you want on your property to build a single single family home go for it the city's not going to be able to tell you though and to do that and the, and frankly we're not building enough because building single family homes doesn't pencil out for folks. So we're not building at a rate that is helpful and we're not coming up with density solutions. And so even when I spoke um, on the bill, you know, I support things like transit-oriented development, I support other policies, but I think we need to recognize that we have created exclusionary spaces that have now led to the crisis that we're in. And the only way to do that is by eliminating that. So there's a lot more pieces to the bill, but I, I just appreciate yeah. you bringing, asking me that question. Um, but the the basic idea here, though, is that if you don't have restrictions that so much of the land has to be single family housing, there'll be more right. land available for multifamily housing or duplexes, et cetera, more supply. Ideally, that's going to calm down some of the prices on housing. Is that kind of the, the big idea behind this? 
It is. And yeah. I think part of that is also recognizing that, you know, we have, we want to avoid sprawl. Like if you look at the, the stakeholders, for example, that supported 1110, that's a huge and broad list of stakeholders because it was a way to increase density without having the type of environmental impacts we want to avoid without taking up ag land, right? So it serves multiple purposes. But what you just brought up about, you know, supply and demand is part of affordability. Um, I don't know if it's been said yet, but we had heard, and I think the house came up with this, so all credit for the house, uh, you know, the three-legged stool to solve for housing was the supply issue, because you can't do anything if you don't have housing supply. Um, you know, it's the subsidy issue, which I think we did quite a bit on in capital budget. But again, there's that stabilization issue that's the third leg that I think is outstanding. So um, I, I, folks, I think we're kind of struggling a little bit um, in terms of which ones they felt they could support based on whatever. But I was like, hey, I brought the three big bills in in all three of those areas. I brought, brought the governor's referendum, uh, the middle housing bill, and the rent stabilization bill because you, you need all of it. And I understand that the, the zoning reform will encompass most of the area in the state, but there are some housing associations will, which will be exempt from this. They'll be able to stay in those geographic areas, single family, for example. Is that right? Yeah, so the legal issues around impairment of contract. So without yeah, yeah. getting really lawyer wonky. Right. If you've got contracts that exist, it, it becomes very sticky for the state. And I and I say sticky, but really we're precluded where there's an obvious contract from then disrupting that contract with whatever we're putting forward. There's some caveats for that, which is, you know, there's always rules and then the exception to the rule. So that was a big issue. But look, I'm just going to be honest. HOAs are an issue. HOAs are, and they have a strong lobbying force um, and they, but but they continue, and I think they've come to the table in certain respects this year. We worked on a child care bill um, by allowing child care access, you know, people to have child care businesses and access child care in HOA communities. But it wasn't easy. Um, it certainly wasn't easy. And I think we're going to have to figure out um, how, to, how to get through some of those uh, roadblocks that I think HOAs continue to present us. But I think in this, in this regard, we, we had to do what we felt was the most legally sound um, and appropriate path in the bill. Yeah, I want to get I want to get to the the ADU the accessory dwelling unit bill also with you Senator Trudeau but first of all does anybody else have anything to add about the zoning reform bill that went through and how it's going to free up more land for multifamily development and ideally uh, somehow relieve the cost of housing does any other else have anything to add on that Well one thing I'd mention yeah. Ross is that um, you know zoning reform is a piece of it but in yeah. order to help uh, reduce costs of development. There were other key steps that the legislature took as well, which will really work in tandem. We took steps on permitting reform, making it easier and faster to issue permits. Um, and, and those kinds of steps in the process reduce the cost to develop housing and then make it faster, uh, building the homes faster, which helps to relieve cost as well. So that was part of the the toolkit around uh, supply. You know, you're leading towards something that I was wondering about in this legislation. Um, clearly something that makes it easier to build is good for developers. And unless this country changes radically, most of the housing built is gonna be by private developers. Government will be able to be the, the place of last resort. But are there other things like this in the legislation that was passed that developers have been pushing for just to make it easier for them to build affordable housing? Anyone want to take that? I mean, I do think there is broad agreement by both nonprofit and for-profit developers that addressing permitting, addressing design review, uh, addressing some of the inefficient processes that have cost and are primarily controlled at a local level, but the state stepped in and said, as a matter of our broader housing crisis, we have to take steps to address it. Those are good across the board. They mm -hmm. help make market rate housing more efficient and they're gonna help to make affordable housing more efficient. Okay, and I Ross, want... Ross I just wanna hi highlight on this yeah. a, a little bit. Yeah. No, the, the majority isn't gonna be built probably by private developers. Remember the study that came out from the Department of Commerce is that we need a million housing units in the next 20 years and that over half starting to push towards 60% are for low income or extraordinarily low income people. The private development community has never actually engaged in that. And it may be that some of the legislation that we're passing now will 
that they will engage, but it is like that. And that is why we need to find a funding source it is because developing housing for extraordinarily low income people, it has been a historic obligation of the governmental sector. And I don't see that changing in a really big way. We might be able to get some private development in that, but just know it's, this is much like Rep. Alvarado said, the solutions that we're moving toward have to work for both the nonprofit governmental sector and the for-profit private developers because we have to develop so much housing in both areas. Mm -hmm. I want to turn to the, Ross, the ADUs. I'm sorry, go right ahead. Senator. Ross, I was going to say, I, this is such yeah. a great conversation, and, and I want you to know clearly uh, that I, I, I listen, I learn uh, uh, every single day, and I'm learning a lot today. One of the things that I've had uh, just committed members tell me is that they were really pleased to see that we were cutting through a lot of the red tape and construction so that we can meet some of the housing needs. And those are the things that people are saying. And that's why every time you know we talk about what a successful uh, session it was, this is the thing that just makes me just so very, very proud to serve in our legislatures because we do great work. And then the things that we can't get done, things that we don't get done, we're fortunate that we'll be back next year for 60 days. So it's this is great stuff. You get another chance. Uh, yes. Let's go. We, let's we, go we, back. We to, also. <laughs> I want to go back to Yasmin Trudeau to ask about the accessory dwelling units. Now, those of us in Seattle are somewhat familiar with that. There's been some relaxation of some of the regulations that allows you to build a so-called mother-in-law unit in your backyard. And I wonder if you could talk more about what the legislature changed when it came to the laws on these ADUs and what impact it might have on housing. Yeah, I mean, and I, I may actually pivot to Rep. Alvarado, who may know a little bit more about this bill, okay. given that it was the House bill. I was proud to vote for it because I think ADUs are really, to me, the most straightforward form of simple density, like allow people to create an affordable house. You know, the, that is, we know that people are acting accessing ADUs as a form of affordable housing. And it's something that people can build. It's something that um, I think people are asking uh, very vehemently to both build and to be able to access. So I don't know, Rep. Alderado, if you want to talk, if you've got any insight onto the specifics, I'd have to look at my notes at this point. But given that it, you know, by the time it got to me, it was something that I felt very good about voting for. Maybe, you know, a little bit more about the process and kind of what happened when it was introduced. Yeah, please jump in, Representative Alvarado. So uh, 1337 is, I believe, the House bill number, uh, Rep. Gregerson's bill, um, uh, really makes some technical fixes to make it more easy to develop ADUs on all properties, allows for ADUs in communities in which that wasn't allowed before. So more by right, you can have both a, a single family home and an ADU um, and, and changes some, make some technical fixes to allow those to be uh, more affordable and easy to build in a broad number of communities. Impacts less in places like Seattle where we already have ADUs that are allowed to be built, but um, will make a difference across the state. And I think one of the reasons why it's ADUs have been looked at as an important tool is because we see a lot of multi-generational households. We see a lot of seniors who are aging and a need for, uh, you know, seniors to be able to stay in their homes, maybe move to the ADU and allow for a family um, to stay in the primary home. Um, and I just wanna roll with that for a second because the aging population in our state is really gonna demand that we look seriously at affordable housing for lowest income people because those folks on social security can, in many cases, cannot afford market rate homes anymore. And we know that we have an aging population. We're gonna have more people who are seeking um, senior housing, seeking housing that they can afford. And then we're gonna want opportunities for people to be able to age in place. So we have to get real about investments in, um, in housing that stays affordable as people age and that people are able to age into. We have great models of senior housing development that's been developed with sources like the Housing Trust Fund, but we have to bring that to scale. And as people have said on this call many times already, the way to get to scale on affordable housing is with the resources that are predictable. It's also about making sure that we have land that's available in communities 
that's proximate to healthcare services, proximate to transit, proximate to families. And the way to get that access is to make sure that we're securing land opportunities now. We did in the capital budget, put in $40 million for the land acquisition program, which is a small down payment. We'll have to do a lot more to make sure that nonprofit partners are able to purchase the land that they can build future affordable housing on in all communities. The the need hey, for housing Ross, in, in the, yes. Ross, can I just add, I just Please. wanted to add a little bit on ADU specifically. Yeah. So I think if I remember, if I remember correctly, the let, in terms of the details of that legislation, it requires that city and counties have to allow ADUs to be constructed within urban growth areas. And it also says things like the impact fees for building an ADU cannot be any more than 50% of the impact fees for the original house on the unit. Um, it, you, you can't require, it, it says you can't, a city can't require that the owner reside on the lot and I think the other thing is it allows up to two ADUs to be built on a lot. So in terms of some of the technical pieces that Rep. Alvarado were, was talking about, I think those are kind of some of the big technical pieces of the ADU bill that Rep. Gregerson has been working on for a number of years. I want to pull the picture I back can't a little. I'm sorry, go ahead. I said I was, I just dug up my notes and I can confirm. <laughs> okay. Confirmed. <laughs> I want to go back to the just the overall cost of affordable housing. And as you mentioned, Speaker Jenkins, there's a lot of money that's going to need to go into this. A lot of money went into it this year. But I wonder if you could step back and, and to compare what funding was allocated versus how much funding is needed. Is it enough? Is it close? Is it not in the ballpark? I want to hear each of you respond to that. But first of you, first Speaker Jenkins. Not enough in the ballpark, kind of, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, Ross. Yeah. We can never say that investing a billion dollars in housing when, when it comes to all kinds of things is not even in the ballpark, but there's multiple billions, dollar, billions of dollars more that is needed. I think one of the things that we are thinking about, or I should just say me, that the thing that I think about the most is I agree with Rep Alvarado. We need to find, we, we need to identify a source that is long-term and ongoing because we know of the 20-year the projections. We also know if we got all of that money in one year, we could never build all the housing in one year. So we're trying really hard to match our capabilities for the uptake of the money and the building of housing, along with the revenue to, to actually make that happen. So I, I do think that the billion dollars invested in this year, when I talk about a billion, I mean, you know, that's housing trust fund dollars like Senator Trudeau has talked about, but it's also for these things like permanent supportive housing. When we look at behavioral health and substance use uh, disorder and folks who uh, uh, need more supportive housing that comes from the operating budget um, and things like that. So I, I would not, I don't know. I don't, I would never say we're out, we're not even in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say we have, we're going to have to pay, I guess, maybe play the game a little bit stronger yeah. uh, as we move forward. Well, also you, you point out the need for funding mechanisms. And I'm wondering if looking to the future, Senator Trudeau, if you have any thoughts on where you might go in the next session in order to raise more money for this vital uh, project that needs to be done, housing for people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I wanted to start by touching off something that the speaker said, right? So we talk about the $400 million in the housing trust fund. But if you look at historically, like when we talk about building to scale, right, up until this year, I think they said it, it the housing trust fund had built a total of 40,000 homes. 40,000 is not matching the 1 million and that number is going to continue to grow, right? More people want to move here. Um, we know that our population is increasing. So to me, I think we've done a fantastic job with the resources that we've had in terms of maximizing our investments in this, but it has to be done at scale in order to be effective, which was part of why the governor's bond proposal, although there may have been many things that needed to be worked out in that proposal, and I know many people, including Representative Alvarado, worked really hard to figure out if there was a path, it to me was something that was fully at scale in a way that felt like we could, we could start to address it wholesale. But I think the speaker also points out Part of the reason we supported the, the permitting and sort of looking at the regulatory framework is to be able to make sure that the dollars um, go as quickly and as far as we need them to go. 
That being said, given that we can only construct a finite amount of homes and we're also dealing with the cost of inflation, rising construction costs, which is going to make the amount we have continue to shrink uh, more and more, I think looking at a dedicated revenue source, the speaker brought up the REIT proposal, the real size excise tax proposal. Um, you know, I have talked about this with uh, folks in our district. People support the idea that folks that are selling homes for over $3 million, which are not your average um, constituent, you know, it's certainly there are no $3 million homes in my neighborhood, I can guarantee you. I think there is a desire to say, hey, this is a place where we can lower the burden on those that, you know, sort of middle class folks. And we can allow for a dedicated source for these over $3 million to then be able to sustainably construct the type of housing that we need and we can adjust like i think that knowing that we could have something that is dedicated is helpful in addition to the fact that we are going to have future budget constraints the sure. idea that somehow we're going to be in a position to invest you know a ton of money continuously and, and grow at scale right 400 million now it might double by next year i don't know what construction costs and inflation are going to be in terms of what people need and we are not going to have the federal injection of money that we've had. We are not going to have the $400 million, you know, uh, result of, or almost 400 of, a, of an exercise the treasurer's office did to dig out every nickel, dime, and penny, right, to, to figure out how we can meet all of our other obligations, um, in including K through 12, while also being able to build affordable housing. So we have to understand that even though we have resources now, they're not sustainable and so the the one thing that we can do is anchor ourselves in a, in a sustainable revenue source. So I'm I'm personally excited to continue talking about the REIT. I think that the average voter deeply appreciates what we're trying to do with the REIT, and we'll see how that plays out. But I I just think we need something that allows us to have to not be constrained by the budget and continue to invest at scale. Yeah, the real estate uh, estate excise tax. I want to turn to you, Senator Lovick. Do you think that's a viable way to go forward in order to get the additional funding needed to build the affordable housing we so desperately need? You know, it, it's a great question, and I don't totally know the answer. I've I've sat and listened to a lot of people have different opinions of, of the real estate excise tax, uh, and I just don't know the answer, Ross. But but mm -hmm. can I just uh, flip over just for a quick second. Sure. You know, this is probably not a part of any of the conversation that we would have had today, but one of the things that I have noticed, and I know the legislative session just ended uh, two and a half, uh, three weeks ago. As I'm driving and walking around, I do believe in my heart, in my heart of hearts, that somehow we are making and having an impact on the homeless, homeless encampments. I worked uh, the Seattle Freeway for many, many years as a state trooper, and I would get very, very frustrated driving southbound on I-5 and express lanes at Northgate. And now I'm driving through there, and I'm not seeing those homeless people in those areas. I'm not seeing as many homeless people in, in some communities. So I believe that, you know, it, it's a small steps, but these small steps are going to turn into big steps. And I, I believe that we're doing a lot of great work. And I think the message is hopefully getting out there that things are happening. And I'm seeing it myself, specifically, because I always look out for those things, types of things. Well, I've got a lot more questions, but I know that there are some people who've been asking questions in the chat, and I wanted to allow them an opportunity to get answers to their questions. And Ryan Donahue with Habitat has been monitoring them. Uh, Ryan, would you like to bring one forward for our panel? Goodness, yeah, there are so many amazing questions in the chat. Thank you so much to everybody who is uh, sending in questions. Please keep that up if you have more questions. I can't guarantee we'll get to them, but we'll do our best. Um, one question that we did get actually um, is around um, <clears throat> kind of next steps and both uh, as far as, I'm just trying to find the exact question of where that was i apologize it was what bill got left on the table that is your priority to your top priority to keep fighting for and who is it that who do you need to help gain who is it that you need in order to help gain support for that bill okay top bill that didn't go through and what do you need to get it to happen who wants to jump mm -hmm. in on that one? i i would like to and this has very little to do with housing uh it has to do with community safety you know community safety has and probably always will be one of the top priorities of the legislature. Because I've said many times it's about quality of life, 
Uh, we can have all of the housing in the world. If people don't feel safe in their homes, if they don't feel safe on the streets, if their kids aren't safe in the schools, uh, it, very little is going to matter. If we can't keep kids safe in schools, I don't think that there's anything that we do is going to matter. So one of the things that I wanted to do is I really wanted to have the opportunity to, to get more officers on our streets. So I really I worked very, very hard to get a flexible work schedule for police officers so that we could get more diversity, so we could change the, the, the tone and the culture of policing. And that was one that I had left on the table uh, because I believe that in all the things that we do, people just have to have to feel safe in their communities. And uh, those are the things that I, I know we all have a desire to see that happen. Anyone else want to weigh in on that or do we want to go to another question from Ryan, from the audience? Uh I'm happy to weigh it on it. I mean, we yeah. touched on it already, so I'll try to be brief, but stabilizing rents. We have to have a conversation about what is happening in the rental market because, you know, I get calls. I'm sure, you know, others on this call get calls from people that are like, I just got a notice that I have a 30% increase. I have two kids. I'm a single mom. I work, you know, multiple jobs. I cannot keep up with this. I'm about to move into my car. And I think that is actually linked to what Senator Lovick describes because, Yes, community safety is important, but remember that if people are unhoused, right, if we continue to perpetuate the problem that we exist in, which is having unhoused communities, they, nobody's safe. They're not safe. We're not safe. And it's so that stabilizing factor, and I'm not saying safety as in a law enforcement response or not. I'm not taking a position on that. I'm saying that if you want people to thrive and succeed in life, you have to stabilize them. You have to keep them housed. And I'm somebody that faced homelessness and housing insecurity in my life. And there is not an opportunity to, to, to breathe deeply, to dream, to find joy, to think about your children if you do not have a stable roof over your head. So I just think that as we continue to build houses for people to move into, remember that people are in homes now that they're getting priced out of. And I think we have to take that really seriously. What I would say in asking for support is, you know, quite frankly, the landlord lobby is an incredibly, again, another incredibly powerful force that really has not come to the table to think about in and create, be creative about how we can support our renters, right? In a renter, rental market. My parents, my in-laws are landlords. They're small landlords. They support stabilizing rents. They actually see how this can help them. Many landlords that I've spoken to actually agree, but because the landlord lobby is taking a stance that is has to be a representative of everyone from you know uh, big property management companies to small landlords they become an obstruction and so i would just say that anybody that can weigh in that understands why it is important for both those that are that are seeking housing and those that are providing housing to come to a table and figuring out with our renters that is imperative that we do that people are desperate for that to happen so that is what I would like for us to work on. And I hope that the landlord lobby and anybody else interested will come to the table and figure out how we can actually do this. When you because say rent stabilization, do you mean rent control or other other means? Question. It is not the same. It is not the same. And it was a tactic actually used by the landlord lobby to really confuse the issues. Saying, you know, the idea of traditional rent control is that you control the cost of a unit over the course of that unit's lifetime, right? That you are the or thou student doing cost controls. The rent stabilization bill controlled a, a percentage for the term of the tenancy. So if you are with, if you, if you are in a home for a year, right? It says that you can't raise the rent over this amount unless you are able to show and prove certain costs. And I think we've started, I can't remember Rep Ty's bill, um, bill, the bill number off the top of my head, but looking at the way that landlords can sometimes use those costs and fees in a way that is not transparent, right? But this bill says, hey, if you have legitimate costs and fees that are causing you to raise your rent, then identify those. We want to accommodate those. But if you have somebody that is a, in a tenancy with you, for the love of God, don't increase the rent by 30%. Guess what's going to happen? They are now going to be in that tent on the sidewalk. Like we are literally just putting them on a path directly to that. And then we have to worry about how much law enforcement response is available or whatever, all these other symptomatic solutions, right? And, and I'm not, again, I'm not taking a position on which symptomatic solutions are, are valid or not. But I think having, that was the question that I was hoping we could actually help to answer, but it was so hard. We had all people show up in droves with rent control kills you know, going around telling legislators that are not in the housing conversations, this is a rent control bill. Um, it was absolutely a way to destroy the conversation and it worked. And I think we need to, to figure out like what we're actually talking about and how to get it done. Um, and I'm just, I'm not interested in, in, uh, in, in 
in having the type of, of communication and dialogue that we had previously on this bill. It wasn't helpful. And I think it's going to it's going to cause a lot of harm to folks until we get it right. Ryan, what else do people want to know? So there's so many questions um, there. Are a number of questions uh, about 110, kind of about the technical aspects of that. But I'm actually going to uh, what I am going to actually bring up is more of a holistic question. And I'm hoping that really uh, certainly Senator Lovick in particular, but hopefully everyone will have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, the question is, in addition to the lack of generational wealth, one of the major hurdles to home ownership, especially for uh, for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, is credit. We also know there's a disconcerting level of either disadvantage and discrimination for BIPOC communities working, and in particularly millennials, face with credit. So how can we tackle credit scores? Could we look at how credit scoring as a system can be addressed and changed as an institution to eliminate barriers to home ownership? Wow, what a, what a great question and what a great panel of, uh, of group people to, to help answer that. Um, I, I guess what I can say is that I, I, this makes me more inspired to get back to work, to, uh, to, to use this interim to, to answer those questions, to go out and into the communities and talk about those things because credit scoring obviously has been a major issue with a lot of communities. And again, I, I don't use myself as an example because I was just very fortunate to have a career both in the military and in law enforcement. But I, I know that, that that is an area that uh, sometimes we don't think about them because we don't get asked the questions, but being asked the questions will allow us to go back and say, what are the things that we need to do? Because, you know, we want fairness in our communities. We don't want people to be impacted, um, unfairly impacted by the credit score. And I've heard conversations about this uh, more than a few times. So it's a great question. And uh, uh, I, I would love to have the person who asked the question follow up with me. And so we can sit down and look for some solutions. We have uh, gotten to a lot, but of course, there's so much more to talk about. We're, we're not going to be able to get to all of it today. I really want to thank the, our guests for joining us today and explaining what happened in the session and, and how it worked out and what didn't work out and what the future has for us. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I hope you have too. We've got a lot to think about coming out of it. And by the way, your state legislators are very accessible. If something that you heard today kind of rose some issue, raised some issues in your mind, contact your state rep, contact your state senator, uh, let them know what you think about it, what they, they did and what they need to do. And thanks so much to our panel for enlightening us on the impact of this crisis. And thanks for the supporting, those of you who support Habitat for Humanity, Seattle King County's virtual speaker series and the partnership with Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County and the Tacoma Pierce County Habitat for Humanity. Organizations like Habitat can't exist without your investment of time and or financial support. Find out how you can get involved. Go to the site of Habitat for Humanity, Seattle King County or Tacoma Pierce County, if that's more close by, and you'll see a lot of ways that you can be engaged. Thanks again for joining us and thanks for again, enjoy the rest of your day. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. This has been great. Thank you so much, Senator, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank Absolutely. you for both senators and both representatives. Thank you so much. This was amazing.